Well, good morning to everyone once again. As you get settled in, I would ask you to take up your Bibles, please. And uh, we are going to uh, welcome you back to our study through the book of 2 Corinthians this morning. And today we return back to chapter 4 of 2 Corinthians. We'll be studying verses 1 through 5. I'll read those verses to you here in a few moments. We're going to pick up right where we left off last Sunday morning. Um, if you weren't here with us, I'm sorry. I'll try to get you back into the, uh, or welcome you into the, the context here with us. But in our study last week of 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 1, we saw Paul's statement that said this, Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not. And to lay a bit of foundation for that concept that he was talking about and fainting not, we considered last Sunday morning the biblical symptoms of one who has fainted, one who has lost heart in the ministry. It's a terrible place to be. Um, uh, honestly, how many of you have ever been there and have lost heart in some way besides me? I can honestly say that I've been there. It's not a good place to be. Remember that the word faint is derived from the Greek word ek kakeo, which literally means to lose heart. It's to lose strength. In the Greek culture, I shared with you that it referred to a soldier who became weak and faint-hearted in the battle. He was one who allowed fear to overwhelm him, and so he turned coward. He didn't continue to stand fast, courageously in the fight. Well, in the biblical context, that word that is translated as faint in the English, it has the meaning of fleshly weakness. Paul used it specifically to refer to a person in a spiritual battle, someone uh, in the spiritual realm who had learned a few things. They had learned that their flesh was wicked and sinful and incapable of producing anything good, had turned to God for salvation and for strength, but had yielded back to the incapable flesh to try to accomplish ministry in some way. <laughs> That's the root idea of the word. It is to go back to the weakness of the wicked flesh, trusting the flesh to do what it can never do, rather than depending on Christ who now lives within. So our primary context is for believers, those who have trusted the Lord. Last time we looked at the other four biblical uses of the word faint and we considered what it meant. And I want to remind you of those briefly because I told you last Sunday morning that this really helps to lay the, the solid foundation to understand what Paul is going to roll into in his discussion next. From God's perspective, what does it look like for a person to faint, to lose heart, to turn to the flesh? Well, the first one that we saw, and this is in the order of sequence in the New Testament, it was prayerlessness, and it's found in Luke chapter 18 and verse 1. We should understand this. Anybody that's here should be able to understand that prayer is a symptom of a person who depends upon God. And prayerlessness, then, is one of the symptoms of a person who has stopped depending upon God and is relying on the arm of the flesh in some way. When life overwhelms people and they get their eyes off of Christ, they often try to turn back to trying to figure out everything for themselves. And they try to come up with solutions without depending upon the Lord. It's a clear sign of one who has turned to the flesh. The second symptom of fainting or losing heart was trying to achieve ministry oneself rather than recognizing that the ministry is something that is received from God. And we see that right here in our text, 2 Corinthians 4.1. When a person begins looking to what he can do, what he can offer, what he can accomplish, rather than what God can do through him, he has lost all spiritual strength in that ministry. Again, that's found in chapter 4 and verse 1 of our text. I won't read it again. We'll be back to that very soon to pull in the context of today's study. True ministry is received from God. It's not achieved for him by any person. And so a person who's trying to achieve, is using and depending upon the strength of his own flesh. It's crucial to see and understand that because as Paul analyzes the tactics and the methods of false ministers that were causing him all kinds of grief and causing problems for the Corinthian church in his day, we'll be able to see it's the same stuff that is still happening today. The third symptom of fainting from God's perspective was found in 2 Corinthians 4, and verse 16, and it involves losing focus on eternity. 
God's people are to be fixated on the eternal. They are to be living for the eternal, working for the eternal, not on the temporal matters of this world. When the focus is on the here and now, even if it entails pain and suffering or whatever other difficult circumstances one may be going through, that person has fainted and turned to that which is produced from the flesh rather than that which is produced in the power of God's Spirit. Paul made it very plain that a believer's sight should be fixed on eternal matters because that's where God's focus is. That's where God's care and concerns are. This life is just a short vapor that appears for a little time and vanishes away. If Christ is living through us because we've submitted ourselves to him, then we'll focus on what he's focused upon. And anything short of that involves laying aside his spiritual strength and trying to operate in the flesh and yielding to the flesh. The fourth symptom was found in Galatians 6, 9. When God's people or when his ministers grow impatient waiting on results in ministry, they've fainted. They've turned from the source of God's strength and his capability to what they may be able to do. In that case, they've, according to Galatians 6, 9, they've taken their focus off of the laws of the harvest. Remember that Paul spoke about sowing and reaping, planting, um, and, and the harvesting in that scripture. And he made it very plain, well, several laws, ir- irrevocable laws that God has set into into motion both in the physical and the spiritual world in his ministry he made it plain that you better sow in the right field and then he said in verse 9 let us not be weary and well doing for in due season we shall reap if we faint not now it's really easy to get impatient isn't it i think that we're all experts at that because impatience is a work of the sinful flesh In planting, the laws of the harvest are that you reap what you sow. Whatever type of plant you plant, you plant corn, you're going to get corn. You're not going to reap a different kind of crop. You, You reap what you sow, you reap more than you sow, and you reap later than you sow. And that scripture focused on that last law that we reap later than we sow. We reap a physical harvest when we garden or plant a field much later than we plant the crop. We also reap a spiritual harvest much later than we plant the crop. And it's important that the the germinating work of God's power is done in a person's heart as the scripture is taken and applied and as it breaks down the, the barriers of unbelief and lack of repentance and pride. We can't rush that. It's something that God has to accomplish. We reap later than we sow. We may not understand God's timing. We may not like God's timing very much but we have to trust it because there are some important unseen things that are being done even right here in this very audience in the hearts of some people as we may say, boy, I wish that person would just finally get saved. I wish they would just finally yield to God and stop, uh, stop pushing back or stop delaying. Well, we don't know what's going on behind the scenes. We just have to understand that we do ministry the right way that God says and we leave the results to God in his timing. It may take many things, in fact, may take much longer than we would like it to take. Um, But if it's going to come up and be what it ought to be, we've got to let God do that work. And then the final symptom of fainting that we considered last week was found in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 10 through 13. And that scripture stated that those in God's service who grow undisciplined in the ordinary responsibilities of life, both physical responsibilities and spiritual responsibilities, have fainted. They've lost heart. They've given up their spiritual strength and ability. They have given up that which is going to generate spiritual strength in their lives, and they've turned to their own fleshly carnal way of doing things rather than God's way. If God's people are living for Him, and if they're serving Him the way that they're supposed to, They will be faithful to dedicate themselves to the seemingly ordinary, mundane, day-in and day-out tasks. And developing spiritual strength through those routine and unglamorous disciplines will equip them in the ways through which God can work to show himself strong. When a person slacks off on their responsibilities, it's obvious that they have fainted, that their focus is not on Christ. Well, um, Forgive me for the lengthy introduction. Uh, Those were the biblical symptoms which identify those who are operating in the strength of the flesh rather than letting the glory of Jesus Christ shine through them and produce what they could never do themselves. 
as we enter Paul's text in chapter 4, we see that he began to speak about keys to remaining strong in the ministry, all right? So we've looked at the symptoms of those who faint, but now we're going to look at the positive side. What are the keys? After describing uh, what was seen in the false teachers that Paul was contrasting himself against, now he said these encouraging words that I mentioned a moment ago, therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not. And when that's put in context with what Paul had been teaching in the whole flow of thought in this book, since he was a servant of the New Testament, he wasn't going to lose heart and turn back to the way that he had been used to doing things. He had been a minister for a long time. He'd been a minister of false religion. He'd been a minister of the Old Testament. He wasn't going to turn back to those ways. Remember, Back in chapter 3, verses 5 and 6, he said, Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God, who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit, for the letter killeth. And he was talking about God's law, the Old Testament law there, and how the function of God's law is to put to death every fleshly effort to please God. It shows us plainly in the commandments and in Moses' law. We can't do anything to be righteous before God. It just condemns us everywhere that we turn. That's what it's supposed to do. But then he said, but the Spirit giveth life. Because Paul was a minister or a servant of the New Testament, the New Covenant, he discovered the newness of life that was talked about in Romans chapter 6. As we just read, uh, his sufficiency, his adequacy was no longer in himself. It was holy in Christ for salvation, and it was holy in Christ for everything else. Nothing was in his own strength or ability anymore. It was all about Christ's ability. Just as he was not going to turn back to the faded glory of the Old Testament, he wasn't going to resort back to his old fleshly ways and agendas in ministry again. He was going to live and he was going to minister in the light and in the glory that God had revealed in Christ. In fact, he said at the end of chapter 3 that he was being changed daily from glory to glory as he lived in the very presence of Jesus Christ and lived in his strength. Well, today we'll consider three keys to remaining strong in the Lord's ministry. And I want to emphasize to you before we read this text that This is not a formula that's being laid out here. And I don't want to present this as if you'll be fine if you just do these three things. Rather, these three things are the result or the fruit of something else. Paul's life and ministry could be explained in the fact that he yielded to Christ as his Lord. Christ was his life, as we saw back in chapter 2. The things that we'll see today were the keys or secrets to his ministry, but they were really symptomatic of his yielding to Christ, of Christ living and ruling in him. All right, so with all that being said, let's look at chapter 4, and we're going to read verses 1 through 5. Paul said, Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully. But but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. Let's pray one more time, and then we'll start to dig into this text some. Father, we humble our hearts once again before you and acknowledge that if we really are going to grasp and take away anything from the study of your word, your holy word, your mind, that it must be because you enlighten us and give us understanding. Well, Lord, we pray that you would open up our understanding today, that you would shine the glorious light of truth into our hearts, and that we would understand exactly each and every word that we're going to read and study here today, that it would be life-changing, that the Holy Spirit would have freedom to be able to do in every yielded heart exactly what he wants to. 
Bring us to truth, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, <clears throat> Paul's first key to remaining strong in ministry was this. Paul did not faint because he was humble and grateful to be in God's ministry. Unfortunately, some exhibit great spiritual pride in ministry today, and it's been the reality throughout all generations that wasn't the case with Paul. You should remember that he had already said, hey, we're not coming to you with a whole bag of letters of commendation from men, all these different credentials that people put stock in. I went to this Bible college. I studied under that preacher. I sat in that church. That's not what he did. He clearly understood what he said in verse one of our text. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not. Now, what ministry was he talking about? The word ministry comes from the Greek word diakonia. You should know that word pretty well. We get our English word deacon from it, and we know that deacons are those who serve in a church. The word literally means service, especially of those who execute the commands of others. There are many things that are spelled out in the scripture regarding service to the Lord or ministry to the Lord. Generally, it refers to everything from physical service in a church to spiritual service in various ways. Paul was most certainly referring to the ministry of the New Testament that he'd referenced back in chapter 3 and verse 6, where he said that God had made him an able minister or a capable servant of the New Testament. That would especially entail proclaiming God's New Testament truth. But we have to go even further than that, and I'll mention a few other ways in which Paul had received a special ministry. Paul was called to some very specific ministry as an apostle. He's called the apostle to the Gentiles in Scripture. In Galatians, Paul stated that Peter was called by God to be the apostle to the Jewish world, that he had been called to be the apostle to the Gentile world. Uh, he was an apostle, that means an ambassador, but he was also a preacher. An apostle is one sent forth as a representative. A preacher is one who declares a message. The message that he had to declare was the message of the New Testament, which all centered around Jesus Christ, his power to save, his power to change and transform lives. That was Paul's life. That was his calling, was to be a preacher of that message. That was his assignment. That was his ministry from God. Now, even though there's a, a chapter break here between 3 and 4, if you're looking at it in your Bible, you should be able to tell very easily that the continuity of thought continues straight through from chapter 3 into chapter 4. All right? So don't think that there's just a, a definitive break there and there's a new thought being described. Paul didn't change subjects. He didn't alter the flow of thought. Uh, some uh, th those who translated into English and then broke this down so that we could easily find books and chapters and verses, put those breaks in there, all right? So he began our text today with the word, therefore. I learned in Bible study methods class in Bible college about 25 years ago that anytime we see a therefore in the Bible, we must look and see what it's there for, all right? And so that's drilled into my mind every time I see that, that little saying comes, uh, comes back. Paul has already told us what it's there for. And as I just mentioned, it refers to being a minister of the New Testament. Yes, he was an apostle. And yes, he had a ministry to the Gentiles. But the real thing he was talking about in verse 1, seeing we have received this ministry, was that he got the opportunity to preach the message of grace to a world that had never heard it before. And that privilege was a gift from God. He saw it as a gift from God. In fact, you can tell that in the verb tense of the phrase, as we have received mercy. All right, I'll give you a little Greek lesson here like I typically do. It's in the, the, the verb there is in the aorist indicative passive. The aorist tense in the Greek means that it occurred at a specific point in time and that its effects continued on indefinitely into the future. So there was a given point when Paul was given this ministry and the power of it and the enabling of it continued. Particularly, we can note this as we study scripture, at the time that God saved him, God had a specific purpose for him. God assigned him that privilege. The indicative mood means that it is absolutely sure and reliable. 
unshakable. It's not going to change. God had dictated, this is the way that, that it is. This is my desire for your life. This is what I want you to do. The passive voice is interesting. It means that somebody else initiated the action. He was just the, bene the benefactor of it. He was the recipient of that action. God had done the action. Paul didn't initiate the ministry. He didn't come up with the ministry. He didn't choose it as a career field or a job. He didn't initiate it. God initiated it into his life and directed him in that. Now, the word mercy was added to the equation, which emphasizes further that Paul hadn't sought out God to be saved. God sought him out. God found him. God humbled him on that Damascus road. Paul also hadn't sought out or manufactured the ministry that he was serving in. God gave him this ministry. It was God's ministry. The word mercy is one of the most powerful words in the English language, and I wouldn't have you skip over it quickly without giving it a little bit of thought. It means that God literally withheld the judgment that Paul was due. He understood that. He mentioned it in this verse. Judgment was deserved, but salvation and forgiveness were given to his soul instead. Judgment was deserved, but ministry and purpose were given to his life while he was walking on this earth. Now, for whatever reason, many people don't see this. They still think that they can do something for God. They can offer something for God. And they don't understand that not only does salvation come from God, ministry comes only from God. Both are totally undeserved. We don't deserve to serve the Lord even. Paul's salvation, Paul's ministry, Paul's message were all given by the grace and the mercy of God. He understood that. And folks, it was the key to remaining strong. Because when one realizes that God gives it all, that person will understand that what God initiates by his strength and ability and purpose, God sustains by his strength and his ability as well. The person who understands that isn't going to faint when they're in the battle. They're not going to turn back to fleshly ways if they truly understand that God is the one who's giving the power to accomplish ministry. And here's what it does. <clears throat> it begins to frame a profound heart of gratitude in any person who really understands it. That's what we see in Paul. A humble understanding that though his ministry was not of himself and, though, uh, and that though he deserved nothing but God's judgment, God kindly and mercifully saw fit to work through him as a vessel to accommodate his work. Paul's mention of the mercy of God in connection with his ministry shows that he had a deep appreciation. It was a privilege for him to do what he did. The fact that his ministry was preaching the good news of the New Testament, which had transformed his own life, produced this gratitude in his heart. And I would just have you to think about it for a minute. <laughs> this hard-bitten, hard-hearted, hateful, murderous, old legalist changed and was used to preach the message of grace alone all around the world. <laughs> you can almost envision the, the council of God in, in heaven saying, we need somebody to preach the good news about Jesus Christ to the world. But he's got to be a legalist first. So that he thoroughly understands and appreciates the wonder of being freed from self-righteousness and being freed from the condemnation of the law. And it says in Galatians that before Paul was ever born in his mother's womb, God had decided that's going to be Paul. He's a man who's going, to, who's going to choose to respond to the gospel. It's going to be Paul. Now, if you've ever read Paul's pedigree, you know that that little boy Saul grew up thinking that he was really going to do something for God. He set out to do what he thought he should do. And he destroyed everything and everyone in the process. And then finally, on the Damascus Road, as recorded in Acts, God just wiped him out. He was blinded physically for three days, but he saw for the first time spiritually his eyes were open to the truth, and he learned to rely upon God alone from that moment forward. When God reveals to you what his mercy and grace really are, it is totally transforming to your life. And then what a thrill. 
And what a humbling privilege it is to take that blessing to others who've never understood it before either. And that's why Paul said back in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 12 that he was able to speak so boldly. It wasn't arrogance. It wasn't brashness. It wasn't pride. He said, seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech in sharing with others. This old religionist had been changed through the hope of God's message of grace. The glory of God in Jesus Christ had come to abide in him and it transformed him. It'll do the same for anybody who bows before Christ and trusts him as Savior. Paul said that he had been and was continuing to be changed by Christ. And now he was marveling in this verse at what a privilege and a gift it was to preach a message that literally sets people free. No wonder he didn't faint. He lived in the presence of God daily. He drew upon God's sufficiency to do that. And those who are blessed to be in God's ministry today also won't faint if they live in that humble spirit of thanksgiving. When you're humble enough to admit that the ministry and the gifts that God has given you are all of him and none of you, when you're humble enough to admit that you don't deserve any of that privilege, then you won't lose heart and you won't inappropriately turn back to the flesh and seeking to achieve ministry. Let me say one more time, and I've said this before to our church members, that I'm not the only minister here. Our teacher and preacher corps are not the only ministers here. Every person who is saved has been given gifts and functions and ministry from God himself. He has chosen to include each one in what he's doing on this earth. None of us deserve it. None of us are worthy of that. But each one is privileged by God with what he has given. And it's his design for each one to allow him to work through them in the context of a local church membership. You may be in a dilemma today as you consider that reality. You might not be a member of a church. Or you might not be involved in any ministry whatsoever yet. Can I tell you? You're supposed to be. And you can choose to remedy that today. You'll remedy that if you stand in awe and you stand in thanksgiving of what God has done for you and if you submit yourself wholly to the Lord today. So that's point number one. Why didn't Paul faint? Why did he maintain um, or remain strong in the ministry? Well, it's because he had a profound sense of thanksgiving for God's mercy in giving him that ministry. Secondly, Paul didn't faint because he was incredibly careful about his method of ministry. The way that he went about his ministry was carefully safeguarded because he knew that it came from God. Shady ministries and their methods have always been a dime a dozen. And Paul knew that even in his day. He said in verse 2, follow the, the flow of thought. Seeing we have this ministry, we faint not, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. There were a lot of people in Corinth doing something that they called ministry, but it was fake, and Paul knew it, and Paul called it like it was. He made it plain that he was very careful in the ministry not to put anything into it of himself. <coughs> he wanted it to stick. He wanted it to be real. He wanted God to get the glory for it. And as a result, the what and the how of his preaching was very different from what the charlatans did. Now, Paul had already mentioned these folks before in his letter. You should remember back in chapter 2 and verse 17 that Paul said this, For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as of God, in the sight of God speak we in Christ. Paul understood what his audience was dealing with, and so he, so he mentioned this once again in our text here. Paul's methods and Paul's message were entirely different than the false ministries and the selfish, proud imposters because he was so grateful for true transformation. He was going to make sure the one who did it all got the glory for what he was doing. He wasn't going to try to veil that glory or detract from it in any way by changing God's methods or changing God's message from what it should be. Now, once again, Paul stated in our text here in verse 2, 
but we have renounced the hidden things. The word renounced means given up, put away, disowned. It was a humble and abasing statement for Paul because he was publicly acknowledging that he had been himself in a false ministry at one time. But because of what God had done in his life, he'd put that man-made religion and ministry away and he was publicly speaking out about having disowned it and having embraced God's truth. Paul didn't incorporate any of those methods anymore. For many in what they call ministry, it's all about them. It's man-centered. It's about their way. It's about their ideas. It's about their philosophy. It's about their agendas. It's about their twist on the Bible. How many times do we hear those kind of things as we converse with people in the community? Paul made it plain that he didn't practice those methods or those tactics anymore. Verse 2 is really enlightening in illustrating the deceptive and the dishonest methods and message that false religion uses. He spoke about the hidden things of dishonesty which lurk behind false ministry. That is, they were not right up front about things in their ministry. They were not plain about things in their ministry. Many things were hidden in their ministry. It was not, remember verse or chapter 3, it was not with the great plainness of speech that Paul had spoken about. Paul defined this further in verse 2 of our text when he said that we've put away the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness. The word craftiness comes from the Greek word panorgia, and it means cunning, it means shrewd, crafty. Many predators in the animal kingdom around the world exhibit these same types of traits that he was referencing here. If you observe many of the predator species, most of them will observe and locate and circle their prey during daytime hours, but they'll stay a good ways off. And then they'll attack them at night under the cover of darkness when they have the greatest advantage. They're shrewd and they're cunning that way giving their prey a false sense of security and veiling their intent until it's too late to escape. The statement of Paul describes the unscrupulous way of false teachers who would stoop to anything to harvest their prey. Folks, please hear me. Other religious systems and all the supposedly nice and attractive things that they have to offer on a physical level lure people into a false sense of security that so Satan can capture and destroy them. That's what's going on. We know that in Galatia, the false teachers stooped to the level of trying to put people back under the law and say, you've got to perform all these self-righteous acts according to the Old Testament law in order to be saved. They did it in Colossae in a different way. They used what was known as Gnosticism. That's just human philosophy. In fact, Any of the second epistles that you read in Scripture in the New Testament usually deal with these false teachers in some way. This is 2 Corinthians, and he's dealing with it here. He had gone and he had done some ministry in some area. A church was planted, and then he had to write back to him a second time because all these infiltrators had come, these imposters, and started to pervert or corrupt the teaching. He further clarified this craftiness that he mentioned by another phrase, He said this in verse 2, nor handling the word of God deceitfully. Now, the word handling comes from the Greek word doulao. It's a, a negative word that means to corrupt, to corrupt. In this context, it means to deceive by mixing error with truth. We've seen this word already in our study in 2 Corinthians. This was a very common practice. One of the crafty things that they did to hide their real agenda from view was to put error right beside truth or error immediately following truth. Now, of course, they wouldn't put error first. They'd put the truth first to disarm the people. And then they would slip in the error while their guard was down. It's not been any different. From the very beginning of time through today, people will broadcast what most will agree with as the non-negotiables. Here's the fundamentals. We all believe these things. We can all get along on these things. And then once people are drawn in close and disarmed, they will ensnare them with their error. That's what was going on in Paul's day. 
Listen to what Peter had to say about this very tactic in his second epistle, which deals with false teachers. Second Peter chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. He said this, But there were false prophets also among the people, among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily, that is secretly, shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. And through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. I don't have time to break all that down, folks. There's some amazing things that are stated there. But in the phrase, and through covetousness, shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you. That little word feigned is very interesting, and it goes along with what we're studying. The word feigned comes from the Greek word plastos. We get our word plastic from that. Now, if you heat plastic up, you can mold it into whatever shape you want it to be. It's very malleable. Do you know how false teachers do that? <laughs> they heat up a crowd by getting them emotionally charged. Once a crowd is heated up, a speaker can say almost anything he wants to say. He can change the meaning of words. He can get people to believe whatever he believes, no matter how outlandish it may be. Why? Well, here's why. Because people don't understand doctrine with their emotions, which are of the flesh. They perceive sound doctrine and false doctrine are able to discern between those with their minds, which are renewed and strengthened by the word of God. A false teacher who appeals to the emotions can change the meaning of God's word and manipulate an emotional crowd in a terrifying way. We know this even from secular history, looking at some of the great orators of history that were able to, to bring their people to do atrocious things, unthinkable things, because of their great oratory abilities to stir the people's emotions. When people are running on their fleshly emotions, they can be reshaped to believe almost anything, just like hot plastic is malleable once it melts. But Paul was not that way. I want you to understand that from the text. Paul understood exactly what the false teachers did. Understanding that he didn't deserve to be in the ministry in the first place, that God gave the ministry, that God sustained the ministry, and that God produced the results, he didn't need or desire to employ those kind of tactics, those kinds of methods. So look at the contrast in our text here. In verse 2, he says right about in the middle of it, but by manifestation of the truth. I love that phrase. He did not try to hide anything. He didn't try to deceive people. There was no craftiness going on. He didn't handle the word of God deceitfully and corrupt it. No, by manifestation of the truth. That was his method in ministry. The word manifestation comes from the Greek word phanerosis, which means to make something clearly visible so that everybody can see it. It's transparent. Nothing is hidden at all when it comes to the truth. Everything is open and transparent before people's eyes. Now, Paul's manner of preaching the message of the New Testament was so open, so honest, and so clear that everybody knew what he was saying right up front. It either offended them or they received it. But everybody knew exactly what he was saying, knew exactly what God was saying. He had no hidden agenda. The hearers knew that. It, now, it isn't bursting with the emotional lure that false religion has. It is a clear message that God calls people to clearly see and then comprehend with their minds and then choose whether to believe or not believe. That's God's method laid out all through Scripture. Paul continued, he said, But by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience. And we know from the context already that Paul was not commending himself in the sense that we would typically think of it when we consider that word. The word commending comes from a Greek word that refers to placing two things together, joining two things together. And in this case, he's talking about himself and the truth. Himself and his workers, his fellow missionaries, and the truth. 
God had mercifully brought him to the truth. It was able to flow through him to every man that he spoke to. Paul said that his methods of delivering God's truth was so open, so honest, so transparent, that it was committed to the verdict of every man's conscience. You see, where the false teachers appealed to the flesh of men, Paul appealed to the conscience of men that can discern spiritual truth once it's informed by God's word. And the reason that he did this, the, the reason that he did this is that the most important audience that Paul knew that he had was God himself. And so he said he did this in our text, in the sight of God. Paul knew that every single time he spoke, he was speaking in the presence of God. God held him accountable. God was viewing. Christ's glory resided in him. Now, if you're a, a teacher, if you're a preacher, if you're an evangelist, if you're one who's going to share God's truth in any way, you have to grasp this. I'm learning this still. Um, I've been learning it for many years. When I first began to preach, I could barely claw my way through a few torturous minutes before the sweet relief of getting off the platform and out from under the scrutiny of the audience. Why? I was nervous. I was self-conscious. I was without any confidence because of my flesh. In my flesh, I was mindful of the human audience. That's what I was focused on. To this day, I can tell you that anytime I have my mind fixed on my flesh or on the responses of other fleshly people, I still struggle in preaching. I still struggle in sharing the truth. But if I properly remember that God is in this place, that God is overwatching everything, then it doesn't bother me one bit. As long as I'm carefully and properly handling God's word and its purity and its transparency and delivering it, if I'm speaking in front of one person or 10 people or 100 people or 1,000 people, I know this. I'm not just speaking to you as an audience. I'm speaking to him as an audience. And I can boldly proclaim God's word and I can trust that it's going to do its work in power in the heart of every single person that's listening. James said this, that anybody who takes up the word of God as a teacher or a preacher will stand in greater condemnation, will stand in greater judgment one day for whether he accurately handled it. Paul understood that. How can there be a hidden agenda or hidden motives when one realizes that he's standing in the presence of God. There won't be. God's presence will keep him accountable. It'll be evident whether he's walking in the flesh with his own agenda or if he's walking in the light of Christ's presence with transparency from the scriptures. Now, this, this is the primary reason why I always promote what we call expositional preaching or teaching in this church ministry taking the word of God and just clearly expositing it the way that we do word by word and line by line. It keeps all of the motives, all of the soap boxes out of the preaching and just let God speak plainly his truth, commends it to people's consciences so that they can be informed and they can make a decision. And I watch it every single time I preach. There are people that sit here and they make a decision. They even make a decision to reject the truth and go on in their blase complacency about spiritual matters or to receive it. And so, um, well, we hope that, uh, that it's the latter, that people receive it, but that's up to the individual person. And then this is what he follows with after clarifying that reality. Paul said in verse 3, but if our gospel be hid, if it's hidden to anybody, if anybody doesn't see it plainly, if it's not transparent, if it's veiled in any way, it is hid to them that are lost. Paul's message was so clear and it was such a manifestation of truth that though some people would not accept it, it wouldn't be because of his preaching. It would only be because of their unwillingness to believe. There's a big difference there, folks. There was one old preacher who put it this way in a homiletics class as he taught other younger preachers. He said, God will not judge you for how people respond to his message. He will judge you for how you set the table. So you better get before him, get in the word, and understand that when you stand up and preach, you are preaching in the presence of God. That's what Paul was talking about here. The message was presented in such a way that it was clear and understandable coming from God himself. And if there was a veil that blinded any person in any way, it wasn't because of the preaching. Now he had said earlier 
that the veil was there upon the minds of many when God's word was delivered. Remember that? He said it very succinctly in chapter 2 and verses 15 and 16. He said, for we are unto God a sweet savor of Christ. That is, those who were properly preaching and delivering God's word. A sweet savor of Christ in them that are saved and in them that perish. Those are the two decisions. To the one we are the savor of death unto death. And to the other the savor of life unto life. And who is sufficient for these things? That is, Paul was not able to make the decision for his audience. He could just ensure that he presented clearly so that God's powerful word could convict their consciences and bring them to a decision point. He continued on in verse 4 of our text. Speaking of those who were lost. Those who were unwilling to believe. Those who willingly put the veil over their faces so they couldn't see and respond to the glorious message that was being delivered. In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them that believe not. Lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ who is the image of God should shine unto them. Can I plead with you in this way today? Through the Bible, through the word of God, through the ministry of the New Testament. And and God willing through the ministry of this church. God is seeking to shine the glorious light of the gospel of Jesus Christ into your heart. Into your life today. So that you clearly understand your desperate need for salvation your need for forgiveness of sin, your need for reconciliation to God. But there is, there is a, an insidious uh, desire on the part of the enemy to pull up a, a veil or a blind over your eyes so that you don't see it, so that you're distracted, so that your mind's wandering somewhere else, or so that you just harden your heart in unbelief and say, well, I'll put that off. I'll decide a different time. I'll consider it another day. Maybe when I'm older, maybe when I have um, less things going on, That is the God of this world who is seeking to do that. And if you are responding to him instead of responding to the true God himself, uh, then it results in disaster. But I would have you note here in verse 4, because in in the true context, Paul was talking about himself and the actions in presenting the gospel plainly, that he didn't put the veil there. Paul didn't do that. His intent was to make the truth plain. There was no hidden uh, hidden hooks that he was trying to get in here he was making it plain somebody else had put the veil over their eyes and so let me summarize it in this way and we'll move on there are many who have been exposed uh, to corruptors of the truth the world is full of false religion motivated by satan and motivated by the flesh of people whose insincere or deceptive tactics have frustrated and hardened the hearts of many people to the truth. It's a tragic thing. Many people have been exposed to those kind of corruptors. They have seen the shenanigans. They have seen the obvious deceit. They've seen the insincerity. They've seen the hypocrisy of it. How many times do we hear people say things like, well, you know, I went to church one time, but it's just full of hypocrites, and so I don't want to have anything to do with that. That's the kind of stuff that we're talking about. I'm not saying there's any validity to those kind of excuses. They're fairly silly, but... The, but, but the reality is there are many whose hearts have been hardened, have been blinded because they've seen this type, of, uh, this type of spiritual gamesmanship that has gone on that's not true. And so now, as the glorious light of the gospel is presented to people's hearts, they will continue to reject the truth as a result. Their minds have been blinded, and now when true ministers attempt to shine the gospel into their lives, they won't consider it. Now, there may be other reasons yet other than just hypocritical church ministries and things, but the world has been tragically blinded by Satan and his false prophets in so many ways. But here's the key. Paul remained strong in God's ministry. He kept from fainting by humble gratefulness for the ministry God had entrusted to him. It wasn't a drudgery, folks. It wasn't a job. It was an awesome privilege that he didn't deserve. And that gratefulness then caused him to be careful in the manner in which he conducted that ministry because he was up against many others who were doing it in a fleshly way. And finally, number three, Paul did not faint because he was humble about his message. He was humble about his message. And verse five says this, for we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. Paul was not in love with himself. He didn't have the disease that some preachers have when they stand in front of a mirror and seeing how great thou art to themselves or to other preachers and their ministries. Paul didn't think of himself more highly than he ought to think. He knew exactly who he was. 
He knew exactly what he was. The fact that Paul had received the ministry from Christ, that he didn't deserve it, and that he saw all these false ministries with all their false motivations around him that were corrupting people, it just caused him to be incredibly humble about the message that he had received. He didn't seek for people to walk away impressed with Paul the Apostle. He wanted people to walk away impressed with Jesus Christ and with what he had done in their lives. He said, he had said this to the Corinthians already. He said, when I came to you, I came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. He didn't come to them with methods and a message that would draw any attention to himself. He wanted all eyes pointed to Jesus Christ. That's his heart when we arrive at chapter 10. At some point in the, in the long future for us, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, he captured what he really thought when he compared himself to those other ministries in verses 17 and 18 when he said this, But he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. For not he that commendeth himself is approved, but whom the Lord commendeth. For Paul it was, I live my life to please God, and if God commends me, if he approves of me, then I'm approved. doesn't matter what men think. Paul was such an example of true humility here. We find that he didn't trust in himself in any way. Saw that back in chapter 1 and verse 9. He didn't commend himself as we saw in chapter 3. And here he didn't preach himself in any way. He simply preached Christ and the completeness that Christ brings to any individual who's willing to bow before him. In Colossians 3, 4, Paul said something similar. He said, when Christ, who is our life. In Philippians 1, 21, Paul said something similar. He said, for to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. In Galatians 2, 20, Paul said something similar. He said, not I, but Christ liveth in me. It's throughout every single one of his writings. Paul didn't have anything to interject. There was nothing about Paul that would be impressive to men or particularly to God. And so he just preached Christ. Yes, he shared illustrations out of his own personal life. He was honest about himself and about what God had done for him. But he simply preached Christ. Christ was his life. And as he stated in our text, he was a true bondservant of Jesus Christ. That word comes from the Greek word doulos, which literally means a slave. He was truly a servant to people. We can see that he said that. We're, we are servants in verse 5. Uh, we preach not ourselves, but Jesus Christ the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. He was truly a servant to people, but everything he did was for Jesus' sake. No wonder he wouldn't faint. No wonder he wouldn't lose heart. No wonder he wouldn't turn back to the flesh for anything at all. His thanksgiving, his methods, and his message all spawned from the transformative work of God in his life. Folks, he was grateful for his ministry, knowing that he didn't deserve it. He was careful about his methods in the ministry, making sure that his agenda or anything about him wasn't interjected that would potentially veil or corrupt the truth. And he was humble in his message, knowing it wasn't about him, but only Christ. Now, let me draw this down to a close today. What about you today? Come on, what about you today? What is God saying to you today? Have you submitted and surrendered all to Jesus Christ? The first and most important matter for every single person here is whether you have yielded to Christ as Lord and Master, confessing your sin for what it truly is, and believing in Jesus' payment on the cross to reconcile your broken soul to God. Have you done that? Will you do that in this moment of time? Have something to be truly thankful for this Thanksgiving season. You should humbly rejoice and give thanks if that's happened in your life already. What about you who are believers? Every single believer in Jesus Christ has a ministry or area of service that God gives to him or her through their local church. Do you need to submit yourself to the Lord in baptism, publicly declaring that you finally placed your trust in Jesus Christ and joining yourself to the ministry of a church? As a believer, you must understand that you will do nothing but operate in the flesh in any type of service that you seek to render to Christ until you're obedient in that key area. For those who are believers and members of this church, what's your ministry? 
you have one, and you never retire from it. As long as you're on this earth, God's got a purpose for you, regardless of your life circumstances, regardless of your, uh, your, your disabilities physically or in any other way. It doesn't involve mere attendance. You're not an attender of a religious organization when you're a member of a church. You are part of a living organism through whom Christ is doing his work on this earth. He wants to do it through you. So what's your ministry? We all have one. None of us deserves it. But he's entrusted it to us and he wants to use us until the day that he takes us out of here if we'll submit to him. There is no reason that a child of God should ever get discouraged, should ever get ungrateful, or should ever turn to the flesh for anything knowing that Christ is their life, that he is abiding within, and that he set them where he wants to work through them. I don't know why anybody would ever do any of those things, but I've done it. And so have you. Flesh is strong, but we don't have to faint. Let's yield to Christ today in all things. Let's welcome into our lives the keys to remaining strong in Christ's ministry. Let's pray.